and welcome everyone uh, to this seminar on the function of functionality in trademark law. Uh, it couldn't come at a more topical time with developments uh, on the boundary of uh, different rights in designs, copyrights uh, and elsewhere under consideration both by the Court of Justice and the courts in this uh, country. Uh, for me, it is this year is the 20th anniversary of uh, an appearance with, I think, Alan James uh, in the uh, Court of Justice in the Phillips and Remington case, uh, which was decided in or heard in um, 2000. Uh, and uh, in that last 20 years, uh, suffice it to say that the law is still not in a completely complete state of clarity. But here to help us uh, clarify thinking in uh, relation to this issue are four fabulous uh, speakers. Um, Professor Annette Kaur, uh, uh, Researcher Fellow in Intellectual Property and Competition Law from the Max Planck Institute. Uh, Alan James, the Senior Hearing Officer and General Guru of Trademarks in uh, the UK at IPO. Um, Professor Seema uh, Ahmed Christiansen, Professor of Engineering Design in the Royal College uh, of Art. And uh, Professor Mark McKenna, the John uh, Murphy Foundation Professor of Law in Notre Dame School of Law. Um, who is going to provide a comparative uh, perspective. And so without further ado, uh, I will hand over, first of all, to uh, Annette to give an overview of where we are in the light of the European uh, jurisprudence. Great to be here. Thanks very much to the organizers for arranging this event. Uh, I'm, I think we all agree in the end that we will maybe not necessarily clarify matters or show you how clear matters have become. It's rather the opposite. Well, my task in the 15 minutes that I have is actually to, sh to remind you of the state of uh, the law as we have it in the EU, also still in the UK. Uh, uh, but then I, I will, I'm also going to pose some questions that I cannot answer myself and maybe uh, we can have a uh, discussion and um, yeah, maybe some of you have some ideas of how they could be resolved. So first of all, this is the law. Uh, so we have these uh, uh, three types of bars to protection. Uh, one uh, concerning uh, shapes residing, shapes or other characteristics resulting from the nature of the goods. Then uh, those uh, shapes or other characteristics that are necessary to obtain a technical result or those shapes or, or characteristics giving substantial value to the goods. Uh, we, uh, in the first uh, decades when we had the, um, uh, those uh, provisions, uh, it was only about shapes. Uh, the addition, uh, other characteristics only was inserted very recently and we don't have case law on that. What we know already is, however, that uh, these addition, other characteristics doesn't apply uh, retroactively. So those um, trademarks that have made it into the register uh, that are not shapes but may still be functional, at least under the new law, they are safe. Uh, this is just an obstacle that the uh, new applications will have to face. Again, uh, just an overview, I will be quick uh, about these. Uh, this is the general uh, um, aim of the provision as was uh, announced by the, uh, by the Court of Justice in the first decision that came up to the Court of Justice. We just heard that, this, uh, that we have an, an anniversary here. Uh, of this case, at least it, is, it, it was litigated in the, um, no, um, 20th anniversary, so uh, of the decision of the Court of Justice. With actually. the 20th anniversary oh, of our having the oral hearing. Oh, which okay, was, uh, okay, okay, okay. But it was decided right. a little later. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in that case, the court uh, said that, well, the overall aim of the, of the provision of all three exclusion clauses in that provision is to uh, prevent monopolies on uh, aspects, on characteristics uh, of a product that the user is likely to seek in the products of competitors. So it's the overall game is preventing uh, monopolies. Then uh, more specifically on technical functionality. So I'm go not going to through these three indents systematically, I'm going more uh, 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 chronologically in this first decision. Uh, again, uh, the Court of Justice was addressing technical uh, functionality because it was about this uh, a triple-headed headed shaver. 
Uh, so uh, they uh, repeated again that uh, specifically for the second indent, the technical functionality, the aim is uh, to um, exclude monopoly and to, to limit uh, or to exclude that the possibility uh, for uh, choosing a certain functional solution uh, should not be limited and that uh, the freedom of choosing should also not be limited. So it's not just uh, the situation that there is no choice at all that shall be avoided, but there should also not be any limits on the possibility of choice between different alternatives. So uh, uh, consequently that also uh, meant that uh, uh, it's not possible to overcome the bar by establishing that there are uh, other shapes that could um, uh, uh, achieve the same technical result because protecting the shape would in any case uh, uh, limit uh, the possibility to choose among uh, several alternatives. Uh, in that case, uh, the aspect of previous patent protection that actually the uh, triple-headed shaver did have uh, before wasn't mentioned or it was at least not prominently uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, this changed a bit in the second case that came up to the Court of Justice, which is the well-known case of the Lego brick. Um, here the, the uh, Court of Justice said that uh, it, another goal or implicit in the goal of preventing monopolies is also uh, this goal of uh, preventing any circumvention of the time limitation uh, of other of protection granted under other legal regimes on the basis of trademark law. So trademark law should not be used as a vehicle to prolong protection which has ceased uh, uh, on the basis of uh, other rights. In this case, in, uh, in Lego, they mentioned this or they, they uh, said this with regard to a technical shape, uh, but they also uh, repeated the same thing with regard to uh, a shape that uh, was uh, said to be aesthetically uh, valuable, so they uh, obviously also uh, 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 want to apply that kind of uh, policing with regard to uh, not just to, to patent uh, law, but also to other kinds of laws. Uh, here uh, uh, comes another thing that I want to mention with regard to technical functionality. It's uh, something that maybe uh, we, we can debate later on. Uh, they insisted in uh, the um, Cadbury, uh, Nestle Cadbury decision, which concerned the uh, uh, Four Fingers Kit Kat uh, um, um, uh, suite, um, that uh, it's, the exclusion is really only for products that uh, uh, achieve a certain uh, result, uh, it does not concern uh, the method of production, even if that leads to one particular uh, shape that can only be in uh, uh, one uh, uh, manner. Now, we come to aesthetic functionality, that would be the third prong. Uh, as we said before, uh, also in that case, the, the Court of Justice mentioned this aspect of policing, the aspect of uh, uh, not making it possible that uh, time-limited uh, protection regimes are circumvented on the basis of, of trademark law. Um, uh, and uh, they uh, then also said that uh, there is no way of uh, um, limiting uh, the uh, exclusion to shapes that are really only bought or that, uh, uh, the, that derive or the, the value of which is the only uh, uh, essential aspect of the product. So it, they cannot, uh, the exclusion cannot be limited to mere pure design objects. Because uh, 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 otherwise this goal of presenting monopolies uh, of uh, uh, shapes or, or uh, characteristics that uh, consumers might seek also in the products of others, they could not be uh, met. And so they came up with uh, several factors that need to be taken into account. Importantly, they said in this case uh, that the perception of the public isn't the only decisive one. Because previously, uh, 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 the, governing, uh, the governing view had been, view had been that uh, it the uh, exclusion depends on whether the public actually uh, values the product or, and wants to buy the product just because of its uh, aesthetic values. Uh, but uh, the court said no, this is only one of several factors. There are also other more objective factors like the price and the way in which uh, the product is marketed, etc., etc. 
Okay, now we come to the third uh, bar to projection, that's the so-called, or I call it product inherent uh, uh, functionality. Uh, here I refer you to something that uh, the Advocate General uh, has said in his opinion, uh, but that was uh, also then referred to in the, uh, in the decision by the, by the Court of Justice. So he said, well, all these, these uh, different indents, they serve the same goal. Uh, we want to prevent a situation that essential characteristics of goods uh, uh, are, uh, which are reflected in the shape are uh, monopolized in any way. Uh, and so, uh, again, it's not possible if we go down here, uh, uh, the take out is uh, that the, this first prong cannot be restricted uh, simply to uh, shapes that are uh, independent for a product of that kind uh, to exist. Uh, and it can also not be uh, limited to natural shapes because then the overall goals of the provision couldn't be uh, achieved. Uh, uh, instead of that, uh, uh, it must be uh, assessed whether uh, the product, uh, the, sh the shape has um, essential characteristics that are inherent to the generic function or functions of that product. And if that is the case, uh, those products must be denied uh, registration. So far, uh, the three prongs. Now, some um, other grounds that we find in jurisprudence. Uh, all these three uh, grounds can be applied uh, cumulatively, uh, but uh, then uh, one of them must cover the product in its uh, entirety. So there cannot be an addition of uh, 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 different grounds for exclusion uh, uh, covering. Uh, only some of the features. Uh, then um, the um, court also made it clear that, of course, uh, uh, it, it is necessary to uh, observe certain uh, restrictions here. So only if really the essential characteristics of a product uh, incorporate uh, a functional solution, then it will be barred uh, from the uh, from from protection uh, if it uh, uh, has several essential characteristics that are not functional, then of course a protection must be uh, granted. Um, yeah, this is about how, how the assessment uh, has to uh, proceed. Uh, the uh, important point that I want to mark here, I can't go into all the details, is that, uh, well, the assessment of uh, the essential characteristics or the functionality of essential characteristics uh, can be quite detailed. Uh, and in particular, it's important that uh, the uh, assessment does not limit itself to the graphical representation in the register, but actually takes uh, the product as it is uh, and uh, 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 evaluates it and assesses it for its uh, uh, functionality. Quite important. Uh, in certain situations, as we will see later. Let me please come to my questions, because I already feel that I'm running out of time. Um, well, the first question refers to what I told you about the KitKat shape. So uh, the Court of Justice said, well, we, we're not interested in the mode of manufacturing, even if that mode necessarily uh, resides in a particular shape. I ask myself whether that makes sense, first of all, then, Another question is whether that is so important to answer that question because uh, now we have seen that the first indent, those uh, essential characteristics that are inherent in the generic function of a product can be very broad. So maybe we don't have to rely so much on the second uh, uh, indent because if you look at this uh, KitKat uh, 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 thing, chocolate uh, bar, uh, for me, I, I see a, a shape, uh, all of the characteristics of which are inherent in the generic function of this, to be a slab which is open, in, uh, which is meant to be eaten in portions. So it can be broken into portions, which is generic for that kind of product. So even though uh, we have this reservation with regard to the grooves being made by a, a specific way of manufacture, I think that this is a shape which is inherent in the generic function of this product. The same for this Lego, Lego figurines. I will come back to that. I hope that I will have time. So then we have this, um, uh, well, we have two, two formula that the Court of Justice uh, uses. One is this in, uh, the shapes inherent in the generic function of functions of a product. 
uh, which leads to that shape being barred from protection under the first indent. Then we have uh, the uh, phrase uh, shape conforming to the norms and customs of the sector concerned, and that only means that if a shape conforms to the, these norms and, and customs, it needs to uh, uh, acquire secondary meaning or acquire distinctiveness in order to be protected, but it's not barred from to protection. I ask myself, well, where is the difference between these two? If something conforms to the norms and, and cu uh, customs of a particular product sector, isn't that not normally always a shape that uh, uh, shows uh, essential features that are inherent in the generic functional functions of a product. Uh, yeah, okay, then the question I, I ask myself, well, uh, previous uh, court decisions and also uh, authorities, they have uh, applied a much more generous interpretation of, of certain of the uh, three endings, in particular of the first uh, indent. So in the early days, a lot of shapes have come into the register, which would probably be barred from protection today. And I ask myself, well, how instrumental are these shapes? Uh, are they still enforced and uh, with, uh, with which uh, results? Yeah, then this, the, the, the next one is, I think, very important. So wh what kind of definition do we apply to the product uh, category when we ask ourselves whether a shape is inherent in ge generic function of a product uh, like that? Uh, if you look at this one, Rubik's cube, cube, it was registered for three-dimensional puzzles. So uh, the uh, EU IPO said, well, three-dimensional puzzles can take a lot of uh, different shapes. So this is not something which is inherent in the generic function of a three-dimensional puzzle. But if you then narrow it down and say, well, we're not talking about three-dimensional puzzles in general, but we're talking about three-dimensional puzzles in the form of a magic cube, then, of course, this is inherent in the generic function. This this is uh, how uh, Advocate General Spuna proposed this to be interpreted. Uh, this was not decided decisive in the actual case because it was already failed for its technical functionality. But uh, this is really an important question. Here you see that I, I already uh, 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 referred you to the Lego figurines. Uh, it's, uh, so they are um, registered for games and playthings. And uh, the, the opinion at the EU IPO was, well, they are certainly not uh, um, um, following from the nature of, uh, of the goods. But if you define the category a little bit uh, more narrow, uh, human figurines that are the, to be used in a system of interlocking elements, I think everything that you see in these figurines is inherent in the generic function of such a thing. They have the nodes to be connected, and they have a, a face, and they have a rum, they have arms, they have legs. So all of this is inherent in the generic function. Again, this shows how important it is to um, to ha have the right kind of product definition when we apply, in particular, the first indent. Then, how can a meaningful distinction be drawn between a value resulting from the shape as such and value resulting from its recognition as an indication of origin? So, when Lord Justice Arnold says, uh, when people see the London taxi, they know the shape of the London taxi, they know it's a London a taxi, is that really saying that there is value uh, in the shape of the London taxi, or does it uh, indicate, on the contrary, that the value re re uh, 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 is derived from the origin or from, from the fact that people recognize this to, be, uh, to, to indicate commercial origin? Uh, the same with these two Eames chairs here. Uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, the ALU chair, the second board of appeal at the EU IPO said people want this because they uh, want a piece of furniture from these uh, 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 um, famous designers, so they value at the origin, uh, and this is why it can be pr protected, because it has distinctive character. Uh, the uh, for, uh, for, uh, fifth uh, Board of Appeal said, well, people want this because it comes from the famous designer, so they are interested in the design and not uh, in commercial origin. So two cases, completely different ways of assessing um, uh, commercial origin, or uh, assessing the borderline between the value derived from the design as opposed to commercial origin. Then we have, again, with a reference to Justice Arnold, uh, this fig leaf uh, a problem. Uh, one, uh, so th this one is, um, uh, is excluded from protection under the third indent, uh, whereas the other one is registered simply because there is this little logo on, on the flanks. 
Uh, I mean, they, they really look the same. And the, the question then is, so how do we deal with uh, things like that uh, in the enforcement stage? Um, yeah, and then big question, what will happen about the extension of the registration bar to other characteristics? And that, again, is a problem for, in particular, the third indent. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, 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 I can't be too explicit about that because I have to stop. Um, Sorry, but um, <laughs> there are many more questions. I just pointed to, to some of those that I personally have. Uh, but then, and I think that is something that we will uh, touch upon in, in the discussion. So what is the underlying rationale? Is it, is it really uh, the need to keep freedom, the anti-monopoly thinking, or is it the policing of uh, uh, um, yeah, the separation between the different types of rights. And I'm going to be looking at this from a more practical point of view, looking at how the law has been applied in practice in the UK. Okay. When I refer to uh, sections in this presentation, I'm going to be referring to sections of the national legislation. That's 3, 2, A, B, and C. And these, these correspond with the first, second, and third indents of the directive in the regulation. So just for ease of understanding, I'm not talking about something different. This is the same legal, uh, the same legal provision, just expressed in different terms. So these exclusions, they apply, as we know, to the shapes of goods, and now they also apply to other characteristics of goods where they're inherent to the product. But they only apply to trademarks consisting exclusively of such things. This is because shapes are always more or less functional and a distinction has to be made with trademarks consisting of shapes which simply include functional elements, but also distinct different arbitrary elements, and those which are just exclusively functional. The Court of Justice has said that the way you do this is to identify the essential characteristics of the shape, which they define as being the most important elements of it. Uh, they've also said that one or more arbitrary elements in the shape isn't enough to avoid the exclusion. So a little, a little minor addition here or there, or a little bit of decoration which is virtually an invisible, is not sufficient. But they do not apply where there is a major non-functional element. How do you do this? Well, apparently you do it by a simple visual, visual examination of the sign and an evaluation of it. Uh, in cases of difficulty, we, we can look at consumer surveys or even expert evidence. And the perception of the relevant consumer uh, can be taken into account. Indeed, it would be a bit surprising if that was not the case, because when you come to assessing the essential characteristics of any trademark, one normally looks at this through the eyes of an average consumer. Uh, contrast that with the evaluation of uh, the technicality of the features that are being looked at, particularly if they're technical functionality, where sometimes uh, an average consumer wouldn't be able to understand or have the sufficient knowledge to understand exactly how thing, whether something works in a particular way, uh, and the court must look elsewhere for guidance as to whether or not something uh, is exclusively functional in that context. So just to give you a couple of examples, this is a, the shape of the well-known Lego brick. Uh, the knobs and the basic <coughs> shape of the brick are both, were both held to be functional. And amongst other issues decided in this case was whether or not the fact that the brick was registered as an EU European trademark in the color red avoided the exclusion. Because it was said, well, there's three elements, shape, uh, the functional knobs on the top of it, but also the color red. Uh, the answer to that was that it didn't. It was classed as a minor arbitrary element rather than another important one. Uh, on the other side of the coin, uh, this is a trademark that was uh, refused registration last year, but not on grounds of technical functionality or indeed any sort of functionality. Uh, this is the shape of a, a cheese with some wax-like packaging. Uh, the mark was registered with limitations both to the size of it, which you can see there in the representation, but also to colour. It was said to be registered in the colour red and the rights were limited accordingly. So in assessing this trademark, um, I decided that the colour was not, in this case, a minor arbitrary element. It was one of the essential elements of the shape, of the trademark, rather. And therefore, the functionality objections, which may have arisen, although possibly didn't eat anyway, but may have arisen, didn't apply. 
Now, as has been said already, there are these three different type of functionality exclusions, one to do with the nature of the goods, uh, the second to do with the, uh, the way they work, essentially, whether they're necessary to achieve a technical result, and the third to do with aesthetic um, value added to the goods because of their attractiveness, or indeed other things, such as the way they, the way they work. Uh, the Court of Justice has said you can't mix and match these provisions. You can't say, well, this shape consists of one of these things and one of the other things. You can't say it consists of the nature of the goods uh, as one feature, but also a functional feature, and therefore falls within two of these provisions. You have to get all the objections, all the irrelevant objections have to fall squarely within one or the other. They can overlap, so they may, it might be out on several grounds, but you can't create a composite objection. This is the Kit Kat shape, uh, which was uh, refused by the office by, by me, as most of these are in fact my cases, <laughs> uh, some years ago. And in that case, I decided that the essential characteristics comprised the basic bar shape, the presence of grooves, which was used to obviously break off the fingers, and the angles of the groove. Uh, it turned out that the angles of the groove were pretty much dictated or certainly very tightly constrained by the moulding process. So there wasn't anything arbitrary or not very much arbitrary about those. Uh, and the basic bar shape and the, you know, the purpose of the grooves was, was fairly self-evident. So in that case, I decided that the bar shape, the basic bar shape, fell within the first indent and the presence of the grooves, the functional breaking up features, if you like, fell within the second indent and that the mark shouldn't be uh, registered because of its potential anti-monopoly, or for, for anti-monopoly reasons. Now, the CJU said uh, that was wrong, uh, that, in fact, you couldn't mix and match these provisions in the way I've just been describing, and uh, you, you, the, therefore the objection that I'd taken to it, or I'd upheld against the, the trademark, uh, didn't succeed. The mark, in the end, was refused for other reasons to do with distinct, lack of distinctiveness. Uh, but the other thing the court said in that case, uh, which has already been said, is that the 3-2-A, or the first indent, covers things which are more than just natural shapes, like the shape of bananas. This was a great relief to me, because I can't tell you how many cases I've heard with, with uh, counsel arguing that this exclusion was all to do with the shapes of bananas. <laughs> and I was, not only was I getting a little bit fed up listening to it, but I thought it couldn't possibly be right, because why would anybody... Uh, think of a specific provision of law to stop somebody registering the shape of a banana for bananas. It seems very unlikely. Uh, this is the shape of a toaster. This was refused uh, almost as long ago as the Philips three-headed razor, which was mentioned earlier. This is the Doolit toaster, one of their uh, iconic designs. Uh, and this was applied to be registered as a trademark. And this was the first trademark that uh, had been refused in the UK on the basis of the third intent. In other words, that it added substantial value to the goods because of its aesthetic appeal. I thought at the time, I thought, well, who, who would pay a lot of money for a toaster? Because it's basically a functional thing. Uh, but looking at the evidence, it turned out that actually a lot of people are very, very uh, choosy about which toasters they put on their work top. Uh, and indeed pay a lot of attention to how attractive they look. And indeed, this particular toaster had been hailed as a design classic, and that was part of the applicant's case for saying how distinctive it was. But it seemed to me that, in fact, that uh, the evidence that they sold for seven times the average price of a toaster, and that it had been hailed as a design classic, inevitably meant that the shape, the attractive elements of the shape, uh, was what was attracting ordinary consumers to buy it. There were other elements, of course, to do with the, you know, the quality of the product and... Uh, the fact that it could toast 600 uh, rounds of bread per minute or something or other, or an hour. Uh, but I didn't think consumers would be overly concerned about the latter. Anyway, so look at, moving on and looking at what the CJU subsequently said in the Haug case about how you decide or which factors you take into account in deciding whether a uh, shape adds substantial value to the goods, they said, well, amongst other things, look at the nature of the goods involved. In other words, are they the sort of things that people would be prepared to pay more for because of the way they look. Look at the artistic value of the shape. Um, look at the degree of dissimilarity to other shapes, the implication being the more they look different, uh, the, the greater the potential for them to add value. 
Uh, look to see whether there's a substantial price difference between the price of the goods sold in that shape and the price commanded by other competitive shapes. And you can also look at the applicant's promotional strategy or the holder's promotional strategy to see to the extent to which it's focused on the aesthetic appeal of the product. And if all these things point you to the conclusion that the shape adds substantial value, uh, then the objection is probably made out. Important to note there, the test isn't whether the shape adds value, because if that were the case, uh, there wouldn't be very many trademarks that could ex escape this exclusion. Uh, the question is whether it adds substantial value, uh, and that goes to the anti-competitive potential of registering the shape. Uh, so these, these are the sort of problems that one has to grapple with when you're deciding these cases. You know, can the presence of the way functional elements are arranged uh, avoid the exclusion? How do you deal with it when it comes to complex design, where there is, it's not just one or two features, but the whole host of features? Can looking at the availability of many, many different designs which do the same thing tell you anything about whether the shape is exclusively functional? And in that respect, does design law tell us anything? Uh, this is another uh, shape which has been re re refused, but not on grounds of uh, functionality. The objection to this shape was primarily that it was a shape necessary to achieve uh, a technical result. And in that respect, the opponent pointed to the fact that it was a, a basically a two-box shape, uh, which is very common. Uh, it had four wheels, which, uh, of course, is generic to nearly all cars and, and so on. And it's got a roof, it's got windows, it's got a bonnet, flared wheel arches, all of which are functional. So if you look at it like that, you could say, well, there's nothing about this shape which isn't functional. But it seemed to me that was uh, overlooking the way that the, sh the various features have been arranged, because in the context of something like a, a vehicle where it's a very complex design, if you look very closely, you see there's a whole host of design features to that arrangement of basically functional features, which overall produce the shape of that 4x4 vehicle. And if you think about all the other cars, you could say a two-box shape with four wheels, a roof, windows, bonnet, with flared wheel arches. Uh, it's almost infinite. Every car looks a little bit different to every other one. So simply saying, well, you know, there are other shapes which achieve the same result doesn't always give you the right answer or give you, indeed give you any answer. In this case, I felt that the design element was sufficiently strong that even in this case, which is admittedly a, a re relatively functional one, that there was a, a residue of form of a function, and therefore the objection didn't succeed. Interestingly, the opponent didn't pursue a 3-2-C objection on the basis that the shape added substantial value, even though there was evidence that there were something called improvers who actually bought these vehicles, took the brand off, put their own brand on, changed a lot of the, the, the vehicle, including the engine and so on, um, and sold them for much higher prices uh, because they were essentially um, Land Rovers for people who wanted something quicker and you know, not necessarily for use in driving across fields, but who liked the shape. Uh, and I thought potentially there might have been an, uh, an argument there about whether the shape added substantial value at the date of the application certainly wouldn't have done when it was first put on the market, but it had become uh, a design icon. Indeed, that was part of the applicant's case. So it's important to bear in mind that these matters have to be judged at the date of the application to register the shape, not at the date that it was first created. This is an extract from a design case called Dosaram. And you can see there that, the, in similar to trademarks, the existence of other designs is not decisive as to whether the exclusion, which in design terms re refers to them being designs dictated by technical function, applies or not. But in the design law, it is permissible to look at whether or not there are other designs that fulfill the same technical function. And this is in order to identify whether there's something called design freedom, which the design is made use of in order to come up with a specific design. So, in a sense, it's not dissimilar to what I did in the Land Rover case, by looking to say, well, yes, all the elements are functional, but if you look at the design freedom, you can see there's ways of putting all these things together in a way that comes up with something which is more than just a collection of a roof and a bonnet and so on. This is an even older case, the first 
under these three two cases that we dealt with in the UK. This is the shape of an agricultural time. Uh, it's a blade that gets pulled through the ground behind a tractor. It, two of them spin round together on a circular, um, mo a circular device that basically churns up the ground. Um, and the reason it's got a hole in the top is because that's where it's bolted on to the thing that they spin round on. And the reason it's got a flare at the bottom is because that's where it wears. And uh, it was obvious that the reason it flared at the bottom was so it lasts longer because it wears out at that point. So the objection was taken that it was a shape necessary to achieve a technical result. And the applicant came up with evidence from the designer uh, that in fact, although he had certain constraints, uh, which I've just described, uh, he nevertheless took into account the aesthetic appeal of the design. Indeed, he went so far as to say that he came up with a tine that was much more beautiful than the designs of competitor products, um, which takes me back to one of the points on the previous screen, which is the court have said, you must take into account the objective circumstances leading to the design, uh, not just what the designer says he had in mind at the time. And if you look at it like that, I think the answer was obvious. Uh, in another, uh, sorry, the same design case, the Advocate General uh, said it was possible, and indeed he thought it would be important in some cases for national courts to take uh, expert evidence into account in working out the answers to some, especially the technical uh, functionality questions. And indeed, that you do see this in, in trademark and design cases sometimes. But expert evidence has got its limits. Uh, so evidence of the sort I was just describing doesn't, doesn't really carry much weight. And you see there's often a great deal of difficulty in the parties agreeing to a single expert. Instead, they tend to put forward their own experts who rarely agree with each other about very much. And uh, in one of the cases I dealt with, I said that uh, it, it made me think of the old phrase, he who pays the piper calls the tune, uh, because the experts inevitably agree with the, with the case for the, of the party that they're representing. And that's important to the weight. So in, it's important to, in the case of expert evidence, to keep that in mind. And uh, if you're ever in the position of instructing an expert, also try and keep them focused. Because the other thing I notice about experts is they've got a tendency to want to show off and tell you everything they know about design in that field uh, and not necessarily keep their evidence focused on the real, live, and relevant questions. OK, so one risk about going third is that uh, you have all these slides, and now I have like three pages of notes because there are uh, a million things I'd really like to respond to. But since I'm already going to do a deeply inadequate job of explaining the US version of this in 15 minutes, I'm going to try very hard uh, to stick to this. So my, um, my oops, that, now I see why you went the wrong direction. <laughs> so um, so um, my challenge here is that um, the functionality from the US perspective is both uh, depending on how one looks at it, a very old problem or, or a relatively new one. Um, it is old in the sense that the thing that we call functionality now uh, reflects a challenge that American law has been dealing with forever. Um, but it's new in the sense that the way that US law approaches that in a sort of doctrinal orientation uh, has changed a lot over the uh, past 100 years. I'll, I think I'll try to uh, say a little about that as we go. But let me start by talking about the old part, and that is this, which is um, basically forever in US law, we have toggled between two competing ideas about why one, one might be concerned about giving trademark-like or unfair competition protection for unpatented designs. Um, and I'm going to use a shorthand though, uh, to, to describe those two competing ideas as one being about a right to copy and the other being about need to copy. Right? And so I'll give you some illustrations of both of them. But the basic idea here is that one, one version of this idea is that when somebody doesn't own a patent on a design, that is in the public domain and others have the right to copy. That the baseline in our economy is free competition, even for the exact version of the design. And that if one wants to escape that baseline, you get a patent, right? Now remember, I should put as a footnote here, in the United States, there are at least two kinds of relevant patents here. There are utility patents and design patents. Uh, for reasons that I think I'll, we'll elaborate here, um, design patents used to play a much more prominent role in what I'm talking about. And they have sort of fallen out of the picture. Uh, maybe unfortunately. So the second version of that, the second idea that has competed for space here 
is that, uh, no, there's no real particular reason to think that just because something is unpatented, it has to be in the public domain. The question is really whether others need to copy these features, right? And those produce very different approaches. They produce very different um, uh, cert sorts of evidence that courts are focused on. And so I'll give you a couple of examples. So here's a, a very old case uh, from the very beginning of the 1900s. Um, it's about this z the shape of this zither, right? This is a case um, in Massachusetts. And what the court says in that case is, uh, look, uh, in the absence of a patent, others have an absolute right to copy in exactly the form that that product exists, right? In the absence of a patent, the freedom of manufacture cannot be cut down under the name of preventing unfair competition, period, right? Just if you don't have a patent, it's free, right? And then the court says, so we might enable, we might allow somebody who uh, feels like they're aggrieved by that to get a remedy in, the, in a much narrower form. You might be able to say, well, you need to label it in a particular way and you need, or you need to package it so as to be clear that your zither is not that other company's zither, so that there's no passing off. But insofar as what you're asking us for is a remedy to prevent the copying of the design of the zither itself, no, like we just won't do that. Right, that's a very strong version of it, but this was a, a sort of prevailing view. So here's another case uh, not too many years later, and I think the idea here is to get the picture that these ideas competed against each other. I'm sorry about the size of the text on my screen there, consider it was larger than that, but I will, I'll try to read it to you. Um, the basic idea is that the, the party in this case was claiming um, uh, that, the, that another party had copied the shape of their loaves of bread, and that that, that itself consisted of unfair competition. The court said, well, you know, there's no particular reason why the defendants need to copy the shape of that bread. There's nothing in the business interest that requires the combination of that shape with the same size, color, general visual appearance. So it's fine if we enjoin them from using that shape, right? There are plenty of alternatives available to them. There's no particular uh, reason, right? And so, uh, yes, in some cases we will stop people from doing this. We, uh, we, are, we will allow you to copy when you really need to, but we're not going to allow you to copy um, when uh, you have alternatives available to you, right? So you sort of just sort of juxtapose these against each other. Um, I would, I'm going to characterize for you that the, the first of those versions, the right to copy, was the dominant view, but the point is to highlight that this, this other idea about need to copy has always been there competing. It's always been sort of competing uh, in the background. So th now I'm just gonna sort of do a fast forward through uh, 60 years of case law um, here. Um, so this is, uh, some of you might have heard of this case. This is uh, the, the, the shredded wheat case, um, Nabis Kellogg against Nabisco. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, that uh, what the company that became Nabisco claimed in that was uh, unfair competition in copying the shape of the biscuit itself. So not just the word shredded wheat, but the shape of the biscuit. And the court said, no, you know, that biscuit was the result of a patented process and you had design patents on the shape of it. When those patents expire, it's in the public domain. You cannot prevent other people from copying it. Again, we might be willing to entertain an argument that you could prevent somebody from packaging it or labeling it in a particular way so as to prevent passing off, but the remedies are only going to consist of that. They're never going to consist of something related to the uh, function. Um, these two other two cases are actually companion cases. They're both from the Supreme Court in the 1960s. Um, and the, one of, uh, the first the case in the middle about the pole lamp is called uh, Sears. And the other one is Compco. Um, and the, both of those cases basically say an unpatented article, article meaning so this is uh, probably useful for highlighting. Kellogg focuses on expired patents. Both of these cases say uh, in cases where you never had a patent, either because the patent was invalidated or you never got it in the first place, that's the same thing as when a patent expires. So this isn't just about extending the life of an existing patent. The point is patent is the domain where you get rights in the shape of an article. And if you don't have those, you just cannot claim it in unfair competition. So these are sort of very strong need, uh, right to copy cases, right? And they basically, all, all these say the same thing. Uh, I'll just highlight for you for a moment that the Comco case all the way on the right, which is about these lighting fixtures, that case doesn't even involve a utility patent. It's just a design patent, right? And the, court, uh, the lower courts had invalidated the design patent, and the, court said, the Supreme Court said, well, once the design patent is gone, this is free to the world to copy. We will prevent other people from packaging it in a way to pass it off, but the design itself is open to the world. So if you're getting the sort of gist here, which is until about the middle of the century, that way of thinking was dominant, right? Not the other, the other concept was there, but it was dominant. But it didn't stay dominant forever. 
Uh, this is a pretty well-known case that comes from the precursor of the Federal Circuit. It's a registration case about the shape of that spray bottle. Um, and two important things about the case. The first is the court basically flips that on its head and says, no, 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 functionality is really entirely about competitive need. It's entirely about whether others need to copy these particular features, not about whether they should have a right to. Um, and so the court redefines functionality and says, this is really all about whether it's superior in function or, or economy, which is that superiority is determined in light of competitive ne necessity to copy, right? And then it actually articulates these four factors which wind up being extremely influential in US law, um, I refer to them now sometimes as zombie doctrine because they kind of won't die, even though the Supreme Court tried to kill them off, right? They just won't go away. Um, and that, you know, what you'll notice about them is that this is in classic US trademark fashion, the court says these are four factors. No one of them uh, is dispositive. You gotta balance them. You gotta think about everything in every given case. Having said that, in fact, what really dominated in all these cases was the availability of alternative designs, right? Which is not a big surprise if you think fundamentally what functionality is about is competitive need. What better evidence could there possibly be of the, the presence or, or lack of competitive, uh, competitive need than the availability of alternative designs, right? If there are lots of them available, then foreclosing this one doesn't really pose you many problems. If there are not very many available, then there's a lot of competitive need uh, to use this one. So notice that what they're doing is balancing that, of course, e even within these factors against the presence of a utility patent, for example, that had expired. So uh, setting up the idea that one could be dealing with a case in which the, 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 a, a utility patent was, was had and expired, and yet still it's deemed non-functional because it doesn't seem that important competitively, right? Okay. So uh, by the time we sort of fast forward a little bit, the Supreme Court starts getting in on this. There's the, this is uh, one of two cases where the court at least mentions functionality. This is about a case that's called Qualitex, and it's about that gre uh, the green gold color of a dry cleaning press pad. And the Supreme Court says in that case, this is the definition of functionality. And this, by this, so this, what I'm giving you now, is the definition of functionality that governs uh, in American law. This actually comes from a prior case called Inwood, um, in which, which was about the color of pills. Uh, and the court says in a footnote, the color of pills was functional because it lets pharmacists differentiate between liver pills and heart pills, right? That's the, sort of the nature of the function. And so the court in this case says, um, what it means for something to be functional is that the feature is uh, essential to the use or purpose of the article or affects the cost or quality of the article, okay? Good enough so far, but then it, creates lots of problems because it puts this semicolon in there, which you might think, uh, following rules of grammar, that means that what comes after the semicolon is just another way of restating what came before uh, the semicolon, except that's going to turn out not to be true. Uh, that's going to turn out to be a totally different way of reading it. But notice what they're doing is sort of merging two ideas together here, that essential to the use or purpose could be read in a couple of different ways, but the second part of that thing is very much a need to copy, competitive necessity uh, kind of thing. Okay, um, I do want to just sort of capture for you the breadth of what the court has in mind here when it thinks about what kinds of functions would count, right? The court says, the upshot is where a color serves a significant non-trademark function, whether that's to distinguish a heart pill from digestive medicine or to satisfy the noble instinct for giving the right touch of beauty to common and necessary things, right? That's a great passage, it's beautiful. But notice the point is, um, for something to be functional, it doesn't have to be technically necessary. It just has to play some role that's unrelated to source designation, and that could just be to make things look pretty. Right? That would be enough to say that, that it's functional. Okay? So uh, fast forward a little bit. The Supreme Court uh, gets this case. This case is about, um, this is uh, traffics uh, versus MDI. MDI claims trademark rights in the dual spring design of these things that are, these are road signs, and they, they're meant to keep the signs upright and from twisting in the wind. Okay? Importantly, um, MDI had a, had a utility patent on this, it has expired. But interestingly, not, perhaps not surprisingly, having had exclusive rights to sell that design for a long time, it also has evidence that would look to all of us like secondary meaning evidence, right? They're able to demonstrate that lots of people, in fact, associate that design with them, right? Of course, of course they do. They had a monopoly on that design for a very long time, right? And so that's the sort of competing idea. 
So what happens in this case is that the lower court, the Court of Appeals, following um, the Morton Norwich factors that I just showed you before, says, yeah, yeah, it's fine. There was an expired utility patent. I know that the Supreme Court has sometimes made a big deal out of that. But on the other hand, you could make this with three springs or four springs. And so what's the big deal if we let somebody have trademark rights in two springs? Right? Which is basically, they say, competitive need dominates here. It doesn't even matter that there is a, a utility patent. So the Supreme Court says, no, not only did you get the question wrong in this case, you fundamentally misunderstand uh, functionality. Like it's the most thorough smackdown of a, of a lower court. It's like you basically, you got this wrong because you just don't know what you're doing here. Like you don't know uh, anything what you're talking about. And the court says, listen, we told you before the Inwood test, this is the main test of functionality. This is what it calls the traditional test and it's the primary test of functionality and it's this one, right? A product feature is functional if it's essential to the use or purpose or affects the cost or quality. Notice how the part after the semicolon has now fallen away, right? Why? Because the court says, you're only supposed to think about that. You're supposed to think about whether it, uh, it, has a it would cause a significant non-reputation related disadvantage in cases of aesthetic functionality, which is what it says was going on in Qualitex, right? Which is like the reason we said that in Qualitex about the color was just because that was a different kind of case, right? And so the issue in that case was different, right? So many trademark lawyers in the United States think that's a real mischaracterization of Qualitex. I'm not, I don't have a dog in that fight, so I'm not going to characterize it. But notice what it does here is it sets up this problem, which is there's two ways to read this, one of which is that functionality always has sort of two steps associated with it. First, you ask this essential to the use or purpose question or affects the cost or quality. And the Supreme Court tells us explicitly, if you determine it to be functional under that traditional test, the one in the box, you're, it's done, right? In fact, you're not even supposed to go on and ask anything about alternative designs if you determine it to be functional because it's essential to the use or purpose, right? You're done at that point. But it leaves open the possibility that if you say it's not essential to the use or purpose, then step two is to go on and ask about significant non-reputation related, dis related disadvantage. So it's like sequenced uh, questions. Or you could say, these are just two different tests for two different kinds of functionality cases, right? That the first rule, the inward rule, applies to what we call mechanical or utilitarian functionality cases. The second one applies just to aesthetic functionality cases. Okay, so I'll hold that for a minute because then, of course, query, how do you know the difference, right, in any given case if you have two different rules. So importantly, the court says, when you're asking this first question, right, this question about whether it's essential to the use or purpose or it affects the cost or quality, an expired utility patent is really important evidence, right? And in fact, the court specifically says, Sixth Circuit, you dramatically underweighted the fact that there had been this utility patent. It has vital significance creates a very strong inference of functionality. And the court says, you can only overcome that inference if you can show that the design feature is ornamental, incidental, or arbitrary vis-a-vis -vis the function, right? Which is like, maybe it was shown in the patent, but it was shown in the patent just in the drawings. It has nothing to do with the patent's really about, or something like that, okay? Okay, so one last thing about traffics, and then I'll try to give you some uh, things to think about. Um, Traffics in two different places goes out of its way to say you don't have to talk about alternative designs in order to answer the question of whether something is essential to the use or purpose or affects the cost or quality, right? Which is a way of saying this isn't really about competitive need. You can answer this question about whether it's essential to the use or purpose without talking about alternative designs at all. And once you do answer it that way, please don't talk about alternative designs, right? They say that in two different places, right? And of course, if you don't care about alternative designs, it probably suggests that what you think functionality is doing is really about policing the boundary with patent law. It's not really about competitive need, right? That's what it's uh, highlighting. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you a catalog of the challenges that have now uh, sort of persisted. Travix is in 2002, so we've got plenty of years uh, since then. So the first is the one I highlighted, which is that question about whether the traditional test, the essential to the user purpose or affects the cost or quality, uh, is just step one of a multi-part test or whether it's two tests. And uh, I, I can't resolve that for you because uh, I think courts are kind of all over the place. I would say that you could separate it by circuit, but that actually wouldn't be true. You can, you can within certain circuits, find justification for doing either one. Uh, even more importantly, if it's possible to answer the question about whether something is essential to the use or purpose 
or affects the cost or quality without talking about alternative designs, what are you supposed to focus on? How do you answer the question of whether it's essential to the use or purpose? So what some courts who are committed to the idea that functionality is about competitive need, they've just smuggled alternative designs back into that, that question. They have just said, oh, well, we're supposed to ask if it's essential to the use or purpose. How could we possibly know if it's essential without knowing what else is available? <coughs> Right? So yeah, we're not supposed to ask about alternative designs once we determine that it's essential, but we got to do that first, and guess what we'll use? We'll use alternative designs, right? Um, others of them have just said, no, what the court meant to do was to sort of set up a juxtaposition here, right? which is that there are things that are, on the one hand, essential to the use or purpose, and then there are things on the other that are arbitrary, ornament, or incidental, or ornamental. And so the way to read the, the whole case is to say, anything that isn't arbitrary, or incidental, or ornamental is by definition essential to the user purpose. Right? So that's a much heavier thumb on the scale uh, for, uh, for functionality. So uh, if I would have given this talk to you a couple years ago, I would have said, hey, good news. We have at least, in this respect, some emerging consensus. So I won't try to characterize all these cases, except to say, all of these cases basically adopt the second version of that. They basically say, no, we're not supposed to look at alternative designs at all. Something is essential to the user purpose if the features have anything to do with the function. If there's like a drop of function, it's out. Right? Sometimes, like in the Apple Samsung case, they'll say, OK, fine, we'll consider alternative designs, but only if they provide exactly the same benefits which of course is never true, right? So, so basically uh, we get this emerging consensus that alternative designs are supposed to be downplayed and that you're supposed to just ask, is there any relationship between these features and the function? Notice that when you ask that question, is there any relationship between these features and the function, there's a lot of play to be had there in the way that you claim the features, right? The way that the features are identified, okay? There were a couple of outliers there, uh, one in the federal circuit, uh, which uh, basically is one of the ones that tried to smuggle in alternative designs, and one in the fourth circuit. But like as American law goes, given the fact that we do this across a bunch of different circuits, I think you would have called that reasonable, a, a reasonable degree of consensus. The problem is that, that in the last two years, the pendulum has swung back in the other direction because that other competing idea keeps coming back. So this is actually a recent decision by the Seventh Circuit. Disappointingly, one of my colleagues was on the panel uh, that decided this. I sent her a bunch of pieces that I had written afterward. Um, but that, that court, you might recognize the way it numbers the sort of things you're supposed to look at to determine functionality that might look to you reminiscent of the Morton Norwich factors, the zombie factors that won't die. Um, and you'll notice that, that, sne that sneaking in there are the dearth of or difficulty in creating alternative designs of the, of the design's purpose. And of course, that's the basis on which the court winds up concluding that the design of this um, French press is non-functional because there are plenty of other ways to make uh, a French press. Okay, uh, just I think two more things to say. One of uh, the last one of these, I'll just, I'm just gonna flag this, I, I can't do it justice, is to say, Given the way that the court had emphasized the fact that there had been a patent in play, uh, that of course raises the question about like, well, what would you need to find in the patent in order for the patent to play that heavy role? Would it have to be claimed? Would it just have to be disclosed? Would it have to be dis disclosed in the, in the form in which you claim it now? Meaning there has to be a correspondence between the level of generality of the claim in the patent versus the trade dress. Right? We get uh, cases all over, the, uh, all over the place about this. The one case on the right here, there's a patent that just claims a signature boss but doesn't refer at all to these particular hearts and flowers. And the Seventh Circuit says, doesn't matter, that's a version of a signature boss. That's the patent then dominates and so you're out. And this, the one on the left there uh, is from another one that's, uh, this is for uh, like absorbent padding that goes in uh, baby diapers and in um, things like that. And the court says, well, yeah, it's true that you talked about the fact that you use this process to create this pattern, but it doesn't say exactly that pattern, right? So now it's out. So you see this sort of like competing uh, sense there. Okay, and then the last one is this, which is, um, you remember I told you that in the middle of the century, there were uh, all these cases that basically said if it's an unpatented design, and by unpatented, they meant not covered by either a utility patent or a design patent, that it was out, right? That Comco was just a design patent case. But the way that this law has shifted has now shifted the balance substantially in the direction of being concerned much more about utility patents than about design patents. 
right? in part because all of the mechanical functionality cases, including the traffic's case, is about the existence of a utility patent, right? sort of emphasizing that. So that leaves one wondering, like, well, what about, what about design patents and what about aesthetic functionality? Right? And so we have some examples in American law of courts being willing to say that certain things are aesthetically functional. This is a case where uh, Dippin' Dots claims trade dress rights in the shape, color, and size of these flash frozen ice cream beads. I bet you can't imagine what flavor the one is on top. Turns out it's strawberry, but they think they own pink for these things. And the court's like, what are you talking about? Like, strawberry is, uh, ice cream is pink. Like, you can't have that. And they say, yeah, but there's actually no real flavoring in that. That's all artificial. <laughs> so it doesn't have to be pink. It could be yellow. And the court's like, no, go away. Like, you can't, you can't have that, right? So we have a couple of those examples. Here's another one from the Seventh Circuit that was about the sh a round beach towel. Court finds this both functional as a utilitarian matter because um, round beach towels are useful because you can stand up and move your body without having to move the towel in order to stay with the sun. By the way, that was actually claimed as a feature in the utility patent, so they didn't make that up. Um, and the court says, you know, even if it's not, it's functional, it's aesthetically functional because people like round beach towels and fashion is a form of function, right? Making a bunch of patent lawyers in Chicago's head explode when they said something like that. But uh, having said that, uh, courts in the US really struggle with aesthetic functionality. Um, the Supreme Court obviously thinks it exists. It, it gave us a separate test for it. Notwithstanding that fact, there are circuits in the United States that refuse to acknowledge the existence of the doctrine. They just say that's not a thing. We're not doing that, right? There are other circuits that say, okay, fine, it's a thing, but we don't like it, and so we're gonna find ways around it, right? So, and it, one of the reasons is because it has these problems. So this is a case uh, f uh, about the, the layout of a form for recording uh, urine tests, right? Um, okay, and, uh, and the courts, like, like, what is that? Is that, like, is that a utilitarian function? Is that an aesthetic function? We don't know, but like, we don't think you should get that. So <laughs> that's one of the reasons they, and, but you probably know this case too, right? In this case, the Second Circuit goes out of its way to be like, there's this thing called aesthetic functionality. It's really scary. We don't know exactly what it's about. So what if we just say that you don't have secondary meaning in the full red shoe, you only have it in the, in the bottom of the shoe. They'll just dodge it all together. So they give you six, like several pages of like a treatise on aesthetic functionality and then they're like, please don't make us decide that. We don't want to have anything to do with it. So this is all sort of like the unsettled part of aesthetic functionality. So not, given everything I said to you about mechanical f functionality, it's actually relatively in good shape compared to aesthetic functionality, which is sort of like there, but nobody really knows what to make out of it. So the first question which I asked, and I didn't get an answer, what is function in the legal sense? So the easiest thing for this talk is to just say how we interpret function. So when we talk about function, we talk purely about technical function. There are some of the definitions out there. What I'm hearing about aesthetical function, we interpret as value, and it goes beyond aesthetics, actually. And I'd like to just unravel that a little bit. And some bits that I thought would be interesting to pick up is um, this notion of the alternative of designs as evidence and coming from a designer in that, in that area. So first of all, design, if we have to go back to the basics. So design as a field is de defined as ill-defined rather than uh, well-defined. And ill-defined from problem solving means, so if you take an example of chess, and this is well-defined, so most of you may be familiar with chess, you have an initial state, so you have a chessboard, and you know exactly where all the pieces are. So you know all the information that's available to you. You know the goal state. You know what you want to get to. You want to capture that king. And you have a set of rules to get there. For design, it's widely accepted. It's an ill-defined problem, which means we're not clear what the starting point is, where your inspiration is, what your information is. There are clear processes, but there's not one process and there's more than one solution. So what that, what that means, by definition, there's always an alternative. All creativity methods are based on that thinking. So they're based on the idea, how do we come up with alternatives? So this is example of brainstorming. These little dots are ideas. So whether it's you brainstorming or a team brainstorming, all methods around creativity about, are about creating divergent thinking and providing alternatives. And I think the question that I'm hearing from all of you 
is about how difficult is it to find those alternatives in that. So the first thing is that, that I would say, and I would hold by it, the design by definition has always got an alternative in there. Secondly, what do we mean by function? So this is the paperclip example. Um, so when we talk about function, it's usually technical function. There are some other definitions out there. The paperclip is widely thought of as um, the function is to fasten paper together. Yet one exercise I do with my students, so I give them three minutes, I ask them to come up with all sorts of alternatives of how you can use a paperclip. And the reason we do, do this functional thinking is to try and think more abstractly, to encourage us to think independently of how you create that solution, the solution. These are the first hundred solutions that you could find of how you can use a paperclip. And that was just three minutes. Yeah, there's some funny ones. We shouldn't read them in too much detail. <laughs> They're not my solutions. Okay, so this also applies to more what we're hearing as complex products or an entire product. So if we take the Sedgeway example, and if you see in blue, in blue is what we would describe as the function. Okay, so for every, so either you think about the whole product or every feature, every assembly, every little part of it, we think of what is the function, what is the purpose behind this. And then we try to generate alternatives. This is an example borrowed from the States, from Clemson University, where if you think of the Sedgway as the main function is moving people, there's several different ways you can do this. And you can home down and say, okay, now we're going to go in one direction and come up with alternatives. So the entire approach of design thinking are methods about encouraging alternatives. So it's very interesting to just sit in here, all your perspectives in here. However, some areas or some products are more difficult to change than others. And this is an example. So this is a, a knife, a surgical knife um, from the Bronze Ages. And if you look at knives today or scalpels today, they're pretty similar. Okay, so this is an example where um, the functionality is probably dictated by the form and the materials used in combination. So for, from a design perspective, we teach our students how to reframe this problem. So here, the function is about cutting human tissue or some sort of tissue. This is an example of innovation around it. So if you rethink the problem, and this particular example came up from a collaboration in Imperial College, um, instead of thinking about a, a knife to cut human tissue, so if you think of cancer surgery, one of the issues around there is understanding where you should cut and it detecting which part of the tissue is healthy. So even though knives haven't changed for many, many, many years, if you rethink what the purpose is, then you can re come up with an alternative behind it. And in this example, reframing the problem, and instead thinking about how to detect healthy tissue, they moved away from a scalpel of a knife to come up with burning the tissue away and it, um, analyzing the smoke composition to understand whether it's healthy or unhealthy tissue. So that's the first concept about um, um, an, a design alternative. There's always an alternative, but it may be incredibly difficult to achieve that alternative, and that probably comes into the role of innovation. The second idea, value, so these, these aren't actually my pens, but this is just a good example to take. If you take two examples of pens, so one is the Parker pen, same brand, eight euros, a, di a different version, same brand, 3,000 euros. So where does value come from? One, we would say it's the willingness of a consumer to be able to pay the price that you set, and the price has to be higher than the cost in there. But is it from technical function? And if it is, it, the argument would be that this pen on the right writes 375 times better, and it clearly doesn't. So value comes from something else. So what else does it come from? Part of it's aesthetics. <coughs> the two next bits are association and perceptions. And this is slightly more difficult, because it doesn't just exist in the products, but exists in the mind of the consumer and what they've been ex exposed to. 
So one way, one of these, this is a framework that's based on um, uh, Massimo's hierarchy of needs, which I, th I don't know if you're familiar with, and is sometimes used in design, which says that for it, for, to create value, the first thing any product needs to do is work, so that's the technical functionality, in a safe and economical way. The second thing is to be usable or interactable, and the third part is satisfaction and enhanced value. Yet there's other theories that come from emotional design which say if you can increase that part of value, consumers are willing to pay for these products even if they don't work very well. And I'm afraid I'm going to answer the question of about who buys those toasters <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> Me. <laughs> but, um, um, there's a theory from cognitive psychology which um, responds to how consumers perceive products. And one is the visceral response. So this is aesthetics, but this is saying, how do you first see the form of a product and the very first minute that you see it and what makes that decision making to buy a product? The second is behavioral. So this is interaction, actually. How do you use the product? And I find it quite interesting that there's no, nothing about value on, on the interaction part in there. And the third is reflective. So reflective is how does it make you feel? which is actually a strong part of designer products. Some people <coughs> buy designer products just because of the way it makes you feel in there. So this, looking at, um, pick up on Annette's comments about the London taxi case, that, that, some of that is the user experience and the reflective element, but that would also apply to Eames. Okay. So those are the, the three elements. So visceral design is the first impressions, and usually there's no branding or significant, um, if you sort of know the brand, then the fiscal Im impressions, are, it's not really <coughs> true fiscal Im impressions, but it's reflection because it's reflecting on yourself and your self-image. And the second is behavioral. And one example of this, if you have watches, I don't know how many of you actually have watches today, it's impossible to design a watch that only tells time. It tells us something else about everybody who's got a watch on. So I wanted to show you an example. So this answers the, the, the toaster question. <laughs> um, so I have five, at some point in my life, I bought five different kettles and teapots. The one on the right is just, um, the white one, is just functional. It, it heats the water. The top one is Michael Graves. It's a lessee. I bid on it several times when I was a student on eBay before I finally won it. And the, kept, the little whistle um, it's a bird, actually flies off, so it's quite irritating to have. When, when, I, was, when I was pregnant, so the other thing that's, um, I le leant forward and I actually burnt my stomach on the surface of that metal because it gets hot. The second one, the green thing, I, ca I carry that from Cambodia in the back of a back, um, backpack and I carried it all the way back to Copenhagen where I was living and I realized you could buy it in the high street. <laughs> <laughs> This one on the left is from Bowdoin, and I bought that in a cafe where we were sitting and people were rubbing it and pretending it was an Aladdin's lamp. I said, okay, let's go and buy it. And this last one was given to me, it's actually for tea. But if you try and use this teapot, the Bowdoin teapot, if you look at the handles, with that kettle, you can't actually do it. It's very hard to get that water in there. So the question is, if you've got the visceral, reflective and behavioral, which teapots would I have left? One I've burnt myself on, and the other is very hard to use. And unfortunately, it's these two. <laughs> that just shows you value doesn't come from functionality alone, and particularly in designer products. So in, in my case, it's come from visceral and reflective elements, despite me knowing fully that they don't work very well together. Um, Philip Stark's lemon squeeze, I think, Probably most, many of you are familiar with that. If you ask what's the function of a lemon squeezer, you would expect people to say to squeeze lemons. Yet if you look at the one on the right, this was gold plated. And actually what Philip Stark says, my juicer is not meant to squeeze lemons. And I think actually if you used a lemon on it, it would cause the a gold plating to begin to erode in there. So products aren't just designed for functionality. And I think a lot of designing products rely on user responses about the vis visceral and re reflective elements in there. 
So where does this value come from? So in a product, so without dwelling on this too much, there's partly the aesthetics, the associations of what it reminds you of, and this could be either other products or your own experiences. And the third element is perceptions, which for us is a combination of materials, manufacturing processes, and the functionality of the product together. So just to conclude, design by nature assumes alternatives, and some um, forms haven't changed over time, like the knife. From design thinking perspective, we would be encouraging trying to find alternatives, but probably that starts moving into the realms of innovation. And value is created from three different aspects, visceral, behavioral, and reflective. Hi. Um, couldn't you just replace the whole discussion of technical and aesthetic functionality with just a simple rule that you can't register a product for the picture of the product itself? And you just sort of leapfrog these quite metaphysical discussions of what's aesthetic versus what's technical. We'd like to tackle that one. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I just wrote a paper that basically just said that. So this is, so once upon a time in the US, that was basically the rule. It was just a categorical exclusion of product shapes. You just could not protect them. What you would get are more limited remedies that would focus on other kinds of things, like the way they were labeled or the way they were packaged, or, but you just categorically excluded them. And so all of the complication that I described and that other people described is a result of the attempt to do away with a categorical rule and instead assimilate them into a trademark framework and then try to deal with various problems after that. So I think one could fairly conclude that wasn't worth it as a trade. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I didn't really get the question, but I got to, what, what I want to add from uh, um, uh, Mark's answer is, yeah, uh, this is indeed the basic problem. Once you start assuming that shapes can be their own trademark, and that if you assume that on top of that, even that uh, under the EU uh, uh, law, uh, there must be a possibility to register trademarks uh, based on inherent distinctiveness, then you run into problems. Because then it, you still want to keep uh, things out that derive their value not from indicating origin, but uh, doing other things, being functional in the broad sense. And when you start trying to distinguish here and drawing the lines, you get into all sorts of, of, of issues. Um, may I just uh, pose a question to uh, Sima? Um, you said uh, that uh, the value, what you define as value, so that what we would uh, consider as aesthetic functionality, uh, is necessary forming or is something that, that, that uh, is, is, is happening that includes the mind of the consumer, right? The person who, who sees things. So uh, I, I, this is exactly the thing that I always thought, and I think that was also the majority opinion uh, with regard to application of this exclusion for uh, um, uh, aesthetically functional shapes. Now, the, the Court of Justice it says, no, we can't use that because it's not objective enough. We need to, to, uh, to use other factors as well. Um, so I, I take out from what you said that this is the wrong way to approach the, the entire problem. So if you want to identify value as a potential bar to protection, because this is something that should not be monopolized, uh, then the only thing of having some kind of meaningful approach that would actually be to, to look at the consumer and, and ask them, so what is their feeling with regard to a particular pro pro product, right? Well, I think the, um, so there's two elements, so, so there's association. So I think the question that you're saying, where does that association come from? which if it's from other, other products from that brand, then it is the shape. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, no, that, that, that was not my question. My question is, well, how do, you, how do you assess whether a design has value? Yeah, that, that's a different question. So one, yeah. I've been, I've written one paper on looking at how you bring perception to ownership. So our interpretation of value is willingness to own a product. Right, so, so the, the decisive thing is why do people want that product, want to yeah. have that product, right. So th that, that was exactly my, my, my question. Any thoughts on whether the distinctions that are made, either from the design perspective or from the legal perspective in Europe or America, um, 
uh, actually making sense of the rationale for these exclusions. Or indeed, any other questions? <laughs> Just this uh, one more thing to exactly that, that, that issue. Uh, I think, at least in Europe, uh, we, if, if we would bar uh, um, protection, trademark protection for shapes, which I think is basically would be a good idea, I, I would not be against that. But then we would probably get uh, some problems coming back through, well, in, in, uh, otherwise, like unfair competition. You wouldn't have that problem in. in you could be categorical, and that would be fine. I guess here we would have the same thing uh, in some, uh, uh, well, in, in, in unfair competition. The second thing is that uh, I guess that we are even obliged and forced to keep that kind of protection because, uh, as I understand it, TRIPS Article 15 forces us to protect as trademarks uh, anything, anything under the sun that is capable uh, of um, uh, informing of uh, conveying a message about commercial origin, with the sole exception of non-visual signs. So I guess from that point of view, we don't have even a chance to go back to a categorical exclusion, which may be regrettable, but this is where we are. Um, my question is about the exclusion relating to substantial value. If we go back to the Jif Lemon case, the seminal passing off case, the fact of that lemon shape was the, thing, was the thing that gave that trademark, that sign, substantial value. People wanted to buy lemon juice in something that looked like a lemon in that case, but everybody accepted that there was a very significant um, indication of origin. I find it very difficult to square the fact that, something, that a, a trademark should give substantial value to the product and yet that is excluded from registration and from protection. Well, I can tell you in the, in the US, the, that's, the, that's the significance of the non-reputation related qualifier there. So the idea is that insofar as the, uh, the disadvantage that you have by not being able to copy is a function of the reputation of the seller, that's not what it's supposed to exclude, right? So I, I use, often use the example when I teach, I say, look, it's a big disadvantage to you if you are entering the market and you want to sell soda that you're not allowed to call it Coca-Cola. Right? That's a big disadvantage. It would be great for you if you could do it, but that's an entirely reputation-related disadvantage. Right? And so the idea is to make some attempt to distinguish stuff that is not reputation-related, but then, of course, that begs all of the difficult questions about how do you tell. Right? And one of the things I think we've all found is um, none of the evidence seems satisfactory. Like I hardly ever see a case where I think, even when there's survey evidence involved, that the survey evidence clearly answers the question of why it is that consumers desire that product. Even if they do associate it with a particular company, that doesn't tell you necessarily that they really think it's a source indicator, because it could be that they associate it with that company just because it's the only company they've ever seen it from. Right? And it could also be, so that's what we would call de facto secondary meaning or something. It could also be that they associate it with that particular company just because they like that company, but that doesn't mean that they would, you know, so there's, and I just have never seen, it's never been, it seemed to me that there's any satisfactory way to actually learn from the evidence the kind of information that we think we would really need to make that. So that's why I think often it just seems like courts are just sort of saying, this is what I think yeah. it is. So. Yeah. But may I also add something? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the problem is even worse when it gets to this extension to uh, other characteristics of a product. So think of uh, a, uh, an attractive um, merchandising mark. So, so the, uh, the, some image from the latest films or whatever. And you've really done a t-shirt or, or, or a cap. It's certainly uh, the image that gives substantial value to those goods. But are you really seriously saying that you want to exclude these logos or, or images that are uh, well, coming from a film or something like that from, from trade pro uh, protection that would be completely different from uh, the attitude at least that, that we now have. We would allow uh, merchandising marks to be registered as trademarks, although in many cases they would be uh, the one element that confers value to the normally very cheap products on which they appear. Uh, but how do you square that? And I, I don't think that any or anybody in, uh, uh, in the European uh, uh, community has, has a clear answer to that. Well, I don't want to keep uh 
uh, you from uh, drinks on Yuli. Um, can I just close this extremely interesting session with one thought, which is that it's very easy to criticise some of these tests that have been developed, either from a legal perspective or a design perspective. And some of these tests are very useful for rationalising decisions that have been made. If one then looks at the tapestry of case law and asks, well, really, have the courts got it wrong <laughs> in a very broad way? The answer to that may be a quite different question. So I might have a set of unsatisfactory tests, but a set of satisfactory decisions. And that would be a very interesting state of affairs for the law. And I leave you with that thought, hopefully for some satisfactory drinks, at the reception, and thanks again to our uh, fantastic <laughs>